you've been doing this for nine years now, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I assume you spent the first couple of years sort of um, talking to customers and building the systems. Yeah. And then what's the, you know, when, when did you sort of, in that nine years, sort of first get your first real customers and start getting traction? It was a couple of years into it. So, um, yeah, I spent um, 2002 and 2003 working on the idea. It was just uh, me at the time, but I was reaching out to the entire network to figure out how I was going to build the software, get some prototype robots built. I was working out of my checkbook, you know, classic uh, founder type stories. Uh, eventually, was in 2003, was able to round up some angel investors, and we created a $1.6 million Series A round, which was the, f the very first real money that we had to now open an office, hire a couple people, and let's build a, a prototype system, mm -hmm. an actual system. This was like 2002 when people, the invest the VC community was not particularly uh, active. Uh, not very active. In fact, <laughs> they were re <laughs> retrenching yeah. at the yeah. time. I, I traveled Sand Hill Road uh, until I was blue in the face in 2002, 2003. And not only were they not making investments, I was sh coming in with a hardware investment. <laughs> and they're like, whoa, yeah. you're going to need $100 million to get anywhere near cash flow positive. They just wouldn't touch it. Yeah. And um, interesting uh, for me, as I was doing prototype work with some MIT buddies out in the Boston area in 03 and 04, I would meet with the VCs on the East Coast. And it was a night and day reaction. They're like, wow, $100 billion material handling industry. Tell us about how you're going to disrupt this again. Yeah. And I would just explain that we've got this a completely different approach to order fulfillment that, you know, yes, it involves some mobile robots, but we know how to make those. We'd made the initial prototype robot and pod for $30,000, had that up and running. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, wow, this could work, actually. Mm -hmm. And so the East Coast community really leaned into investing, and then we ended up doing a Series B in Boston when we set up it's shop there. I think the, the stereotype of uh, VCs is that the West Coast ones are more kind of gunslinging and the East Coast more conservative financial investor types. Yep, uh, yep. But, but I think that maybe is an exception when it comes to sort of hardcore uh, MIT type technology. It seems like there's a community in Boston of VCs who really like that kind of stuff. I think that's possible. Yeah, and I think what you see is a lot of in the West Coast. There's a lot of um, uh, bandwagon investing. If some, if there's a theme, then everybody will invest, and they're kind of gunslinging in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, out east, my sense is that uh, they're they're willing to look at more one-off type opportunities where. You know, I can tell you Kiva was the only mo mobile robotic uh, wasn't, there weren't 14 <laughs> pitch of them. that they were hearing every, yeah. you know, every month. Uh, and so they took a serious look at it. And it was an old world industry. Material handling is not a West Coast thing. It's a Midwest thing, frankly. But these guys were able to appreciate the size and scope of that old industry mm. and how we we're going to disrupt it. And were your easiest customers, I mean, I assume getting somebody to retrofit a uh, distribution center is harder, maybe, or tell me if I'm wrong, than somebody who's building a new one. Um, like who were your first? How did you first kind of break in? Yeah, and it's always in these kind of enterprise things, right? Isn't it always like the first couple customers because you need to the proof of ROI oh, yeah. and all sorts of other things yeah. that are really the trick in the enterprise for sure. And in our industry in particular, you have to have customers to get customers, and so yeah. it becomes a snowball effect. Our first customer was Staples, another Boston area company. Lucky for us, um, but the reason we were approaching them was because they were growing fast, fifteen percent a year or so at the time. They were doing online orders and picking and packing the office supplies for, sh for delivery to offices. And with that growth rate, they were building one to two distribution centers a year. And they were in a very competitive situation with the other office, su office supplies companies like Office Max, Corporate Express, effectively selling the same SKUs. They both had the yellow post-it notes. So yeah. how are they going to differentiate? And so when they learned about Kiva, they were very uh, quick to lean forward and say, hey, We'd love to try this, you know, in a pilot mode. So we're happy to do a pilot. And was it to save money or a speed up delivery, or what was the? Um, so the overall thesis was improved the pr improved productivity, more capacity, better accuracy, cycle time. Turns out, uh, so how did that help them competitively? Was it they could have lower prices, or they could have they could deliver fast, you know, faster, more accurate, okay. um, and and then they could grow the business uh, okay. economically. Okay. You know, as opposed to pumping a lot of money into okay, unproductive so so yeah. financing, kind of right. Okay. If you're going to be building these DCs, you want the best state-of-the-art technology. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're approaching customers like that that are in a competitive dynamic, uh, part of it is they they want to look at it before the other guy does, because if it's any you know if it is something, they need to 
lock it up or kind of control it. You had to give it. them exclusivity, I see. Didn't. Didn't have to. Um, we just said, hey, we're, we want to work with you guys. And if you keep us busy, we don't have a reason to, you know, yeah. to work with these other guys. Interesting. Yeah. So once you got those guys, then I assume then you had sort of a case study as to how you yeah. proved it worked. Yeah. And it's a, it's a household name, and yeah. you know, and and did, did that then sort of snowball? Or? It did snowball simultaneously. We got um, going with Walgreens and did a big project with Walgreens, um, helping them pick cosmetics like lipstick and nail polish into totes that were going back to retail stores, and then we started getting customers like Zappos. And diapers.com, and and then it really picked up from there. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've learned over the years is it's a very obviously referential sale. But once you get somebody in a pair like Zappos, we were doing an apparel zone for them that quickly led to Saks and Timberland and Dillard's and a bunch of others. And so Gap, for example, w once you get into a particular niche like a, apparel online or cosmetics, you go very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and Am what about Amazon? I assume Amazon sort of famously likes to do everything themselves. But. They have a bit of the yeah. They have a bit bit of that. Um, Amazon uh, actually owns four Kiva systems through their acquisition of Zappos uh, and the Diapers.com. Diapers.com got started on Kiva back when they were I, I want to say doing about eighty million dollars of revenue a year. They had three manual distribution centers, but they had and grand ambitions to grow the business by adding new web stores, if you will. So they were doing diapers at the time, and I, I can't remember the number, but let's say their SKU range was about 5,000 diapers-oriented SKUs. They knew they wanted to add baby apparel and other things and round out the baby category to 25,000 SKUs. And then after that, they wanted to get into soap and toys and dog food. And so uh, they needed an automation strategy that would scale as their business scaled, they couldn't uh, they couldn't afford to put in giant fixed infrastructure and and grow into it. Mm -hmm. They chose Kiva because they could add it. They could add to their buildings as they grew, when they grew. Mm -hmm. And Kiva's approach to automation is kind of interesting. You you can you can grow it on two different dimensions. One, if you're adding SKUs like dog food, you can just or you can just add pods, storage shelving to your system. But if your sales take off, you can add robots and stations. Mm -hmm. So you can scale the output or the storage independently. It gives mm -hmm. them some, the ultimate flexibility. 